You know, as we, uh, as we say goodbye to another year, um, and I was thinking we had ended the sequel, uh, I mean the sequel, the series called Prequel, and, um, and I was like, what, what would be a good thing to talk about? And then I just started thinking about my life, and what was I going through, and I, I thought maybe it would be a good time for all of us to re-examine a little bit about how we spend our most precious resource, our time. Because I have been struggling with time a lot lately, and I can't be the only one. And what's amazing is that isn't the time, like, you know, between Christmas and New Year's, um, it's supposed to be, like, a little bit more downtime. A lot of businesses aren't as busy, unless you're in retail. I get it. But for whatever reason, it has just been every year. It's crazy. And I always tell myself, I'm going to make time. I'm going to spend extra time with God, reevaluating what's going on in my life, making sure I'm good. And I never do because I am so busy. And so uh, I thought maybe it would be good for us to talk about it. So I'm hoping today is really practical. And, um, and if it's not, well, you know, I'll, I'll try to keep it short. So there you go. Quick story. A couple of years ago, I was asked, I, I was uh, on staff at a church, and I was asked by the youth pastor to be one of the chaperones on this trip to uh, Valley Fair, a, uh, a theme park in Minnesota. And so there was a ton of teenagers. We packed everybody into all of these, you know, minivans. Youth pastor led the way. I was in the last van in this caravan, and it was awesome. It's going to be about two and a half hour drive. And I knew something was up when it was about two and a half hours into the trip. And I still hadn't seen any city, you know. It was still all cows, fields, and smelling what my, uh, my, set, my nine-year-old daughter, Riley, loves to call derriere. She just thinks that she cracks her up. Dad, I smell derriere. And um, so anyway, so, you know, we're driving, and, and I'm like, we should be here. And all of a sudden, you know, my phone rings, and you just know this can't be good. And I got the call. It was, uh, uh, Don? It appears that there's also a farm named Valley, Valley Fair, and I'm not kidding. I didn't realize when I put it in my GPS, but we're heading to the wrong one. And he's like, the good news is we've been heading kind of in the right direction. The bad news is we're about an hour and a half away. Now, the only thing worse than adding an hour and a half to a two and a half hour drive is adding an hour and a half telling a van full of teenagers who are wanting to get to the theme park, hey, we still have an hour and a half left on the drive. Now, youth pastor felt so miserable. I mean, I remember when we got all out of the vans, he was like, I am so sorry. But what's the point of the story? Let me look. I'm just kidding. The point of the story is if you want to arrive at the right destination, you need to go on the right road. Right? I mean, if you want to get where you want to go, it's a good idea once in a while to stop and check the map and make sure you're on the right path to get there, to see if you've gotten off course. I think that that is such a, a good illustration of what happens to all of us in our lives, where, you know, we, we, we know what we want. We want, you know, good marriages and healthy kids, and, and we want to have a job that, you know, do well there. We want to be healthy physically and spiritually and relationally and all this stuff. We know what we want to get to, but the reality is that very, very seldom do we actually get on the road that gets us to that destination. So, you know, it's New Year's Eve, and I just thought it would be a great natural place to kind of hit the reset button and to say, to kind of look at our lives and check some things uh, about our lives because um, we, we are... Those, those of us who have chosen to follow Jesus, we have very few things that we can take with us when we get to heaven. We can take our experiences, and we can take the people in our lives. But that's it. Time is so short. You know, I, I'm 46. I keep thinking I'm 48. I don't know why. People keep asking me, and I'm like, I'm 48. No, 48. I, I miss 47. I don't know why. I always tell the wrong age. And, um, but... You know, I, I look at my kids, and um, we're, we're moving, we're packing and stuff, and so I'm going through boxes and looking at old pictures, and you go, oh my gosh, my kids look so young. That was, how long, that was nine years ago, eight years ago? How is that possible that decades can pass, and we just don't even realize it? And so I thought it would be a good, you know, a good uh, thing to talk about, because um, <laughs> Scripture talks a lot about time. Now, when we do evaluate, it's always good to ask questions. 
And, and some good questions to ask and, and questions that we often ask are, you know, like, what is the right thing to do? I want to be on the right destination, the right road. What is the right thing to do? Or, or a better question, what is the best thing to do? Okay, there's a lot of options, but which one's the best? I, I translate that into, what would my mom tell me not to do? That's probably a gr- a, even a better question because that would kind of help me determine what's the best. Some of us, we ask these other questions internally. Questions like, you know, what would get the best laugh? I get in trouble when I ask that question. (laughs) Sadly, it's the one that comes to my mind the most. Another question. What would keep my wife from recognizing that I'm an idiot? Another great question because I fail that one often too. I, I don't ask that question and I often find myself looking like an idiot to her. So good questions. But today, I want to talk about what I think is the best question possible to ask. This is a question that would change the trajectory of your life if you asked it in every situation. This is one, you know, this is one to write down. I didn't make it up. In fact, I got it from the Apostle Paul. And it's on the screen. What is the wise thing to do? Not what is the right thing to do. Not what is the best thing to do. What is the wise thing? Thing to do. That's what we're going to spend time with. Because every time you face a decision in life, every time you hit a crossroad, your trajectory would be radically benefited by this question. In this moment, what is the wise thing to do? It's a question that influences every area of our life. I mean, you ask, simple, do I watch another episode of Stranger Things <laughs> or do I play with my daughter? Do, do I wake up early and connect with God? Do I stay up a little bit later and sleep in those extra few minutes? D- do I buy that thing that I really want using the credit card? Or do I save up and pay cash? Do I invest 15 minutes reading a book? Or do I just check Facebook again? I mean, none of these are bad things necessarily. But what is the wise thing to do? See, most of us, we, we want to ask the question, what do I want to do? I mean, that's the question we all like. What do I want to do? And we already know the answer to that. <laughs> so much more fun than the wise thing. But, but that question, what do I want to do, never gets us to where we want to go. It never puts us on the right path to get to the destination that we want. So the question we're going to talk about today is, what is the wise thing to do? Now, growing up with a dad who was a cop, and who was in the Navy. And my dad was a police officer in Miami for nine years and then in Central Florida for 15 years. He was a hardcore guy. Now, I was very grateful and fortunate to have a dad like this because he definitely had black and white lines, but for some reason, and I don't know where he got it because he didn't get it from his parents, but he always told me he loved me and that I'd never be too old to get a hug from my dad. So I had this strength yet love. So I was very blessed in that way. But I remember my dad telling me over and over, I mean, I probably have heard this a million times. It's this statement. You can pay now or you can pay later, but you're always going to pay. He, t- I, I, he would tell me, you know, I, I'd struggle in school or I'd get a C or something. And he'd go, I was Donnie back then because he was Don and I wasn't allowed to have his name. So, uh, Donnie, you can pay now or you can pay later, but you're always going to pay. You can pay and do well in school now. Or you can pay later and have a job that you have to work really hard at. But I promise you this, if you pay now, it's a lot easier than if you pay later. Always used to tell me that. Some of the best advice I ever got, I hated it at the time. I was like, because it never let me do what I wanted to do. But now that I look back, I'm like telling this to my kids. Very wise man once told me, you know, and uh, (laughs) do what I say, pay now or pay later. So, pay now or pay later. Working hard now is easier than working hard later. Eating healthy and exercising now is so much easier than a heart attack later. Living living life within your means now is so much easier than paying off debt later. Our Our choices matter. Our time matters because we can't get it back. We can't. If you're always working and you miss your kids growing up, it's not like you can go make that up. You can't get it back. If, if you neglect your spouse and you don't spend time working on the relationship, the time is lost. I mean, you could do other things, but you've lost the time. Time is a gift from God. 
And we are managers of the time. We are stewards of the time God has given us. So today we're going to look at a passage where Paul, the Apostle Paul, he, he tries to help the Ephesians understand this concept. Now, um, the book of Ephesians is a, is a book written by the Apostle Paul to, to a community that he had spent three years with. It's one of the longest times he ever spent in one place. He, he was a part of this church, and he just he loved on these people. And um, he, he, when he left, he wrote them back, and he knew he'd probably never see them again. And they had this just incredible time of crying and, and loving each other and just saying goodbye. And, and he, he leaves, and then a couple years later, he writes this book. And this letter called the, the book of Ephesians. And in this letter, he tries to explain to them what it looks like to live life in Christ. To live life filled with the Spirit. Because, he, he, you know, he had told the Romans, don't be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Live differently than the world tells you to live. Because the world says, get what you want, get it now. And he's saying, no, 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 don't live that way. Be renewed by the transformation of your mind. And so he writes to the Ephesians this particular passage. And he says, be very careful then how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise. Making the most of every opportunity. Because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish. But understand what the Lord's will is. I mean, you look at this. Be, Be careful how you live. Be intentional with your time. Don't live as unwise people who waste their time, but make the most of every opportunity that God has given you. Time is limited. Redeem it for all it's worth. It's not natural to do that. I mean, it's hard. Why? Because the days are evil. There's a lot of things that that try to pull us away from spending our time wisely, from living wisely. The, The... the, our culture that we live in, the world around us, the, the TV and media and all, just the culture wants, wants us to use our time on things that really don't matter in the long run. It's the thing that pulls all of us. It's why we, we, we subscribe to Netflix and Amazon Prime and, and Hulu and, and why we're on Snapchat and Facebook and Twitter, although nobody uses Twitter except our president. And, um, you know, we have all of this stuff that takes up our time. And we're so busy, and none of it, I mean, really, in the long run, matters. The world wants to eat up our time. Our culture emphasizes, get what you want now. Concepts like responsibility and delayed gratification, they're not taught. That that saying, pay now or pay later, I am so thankful I had a dad who taught me that. I wish I would have listened more when I was younger, and now, actually, now that I'm thinking about it, I mean... We're just not told that paying later costs so much more. But it does. So the Apostle Paul is saying, get the most value out of your time. Don't be duped into thinking that you can make up that lost time. Make the most of every opportunity. Otherwise, we're going to look back with so much regret. And if I could ask everybody in this room, and I'm not, to raise your hand if you, if you have some regrets that you wish you could have used your time differently in the past. I mean, ev- I would bet almost everybody would raise their hand. We need a reset. We need to choose wisely because this is what the Lord's will is. Choose wisely. Most of us, though, we're not, we're not taught how to be wise with our time. How do you do that? How are you wise with your time? You know, the Apostle Paul then spends the next two chapters, or actually the rest of of chapter 5 and then all of chapter 6, talking about how to live wisely in various areas of your life, especially when it comes to relationships. And he starts talking about all of these relationships, and frankly, it would be an amazing series. We could never do it in one message. I would encourage you, if you're like, I would love to get closer to God, reading the last two chapters of Ephesians would change your life. Maybe mark that down. That would be a great, some great quiet time this week, reading those two chapters, because they're very practical. Probably some of the most practical teachings in all of Scripture are chapters 5 and 6 of, of the book of Ephesians. And if you look kind of at the big picture, how does Paul flesh this out? What does it look like to live wisely? How, what does it look like to make the most of our time? You kind of see a principle develop 
<clears throat> that I'll put on the screen. The principle is he encourages us to consistently invest small amounts of time in an activity because it has cumulative benefit. So the principle, consistently investing small amounts of time in an activity has a cumulative benefit. In other words, if we intentionally do small things, the right things, the wise things, over and over and over, we get significant results because they build on one another. They build on one another. And you see it every day. Like, for instance, many, don't raise your hand again, but how many of us have this New Year's resolution, I want to be healthy this year. I'm going to eat right and I'm going to exercise. <laughs> yeah, me too. I, it's my New Year's resolution every year, and every year I gain five more pounds. I'm obviously not doing something right. But we have this. So we, we get this, we're motivated, and we go work out for 30 minutes or even an hour. Haven't worked out in years, but we do it. What benefit do we get from that? Yeah, not being able to stand up straight tomorrow. That's what we get. I know. And not being able, if you're like me, it might be a week before you can actually stand up straight. My kids will tickle me and you're like, oh, please stop tickling me because I'm just in so much pain. But 30 minutes of exercise four times a week for a year, what kind of benefit does that have? Immense benefit. Let's make it like with the church family. You visit a church small group one time. What do you get? Uncomfortable. That's what you get. But you invest in a small group of people for six months. What do you get? Relationships that last a lifetime. Consistently investing small amounts of time in, a, in an activity has cumulative benefit. And it's true also in the negative. Because negative is also cumulative. You forget to floss your teeth tonight. No big deal. But don't floss your teeth for years and what happens? Consequences, yeah. <laughs> you choose to eat unhealthy on vacation. So what? You might gain a few pounds. You choose to eat unhealthy for years, and you might not get to live and see your grandkids. Negative is the same way. That's why the Apostle Paul says, make the most of your time. And again, I don't know if this is for you. This one's for me because I, I can find myself so easily choosing to do random activities. Check my email instead of doing something with intention. And what happens is, you know, a day will go by, a week will go by, and I'll, and I'll have done these, these activities that mean nothing. And I can't, I, I can't even remember what I did. And uh, oh, let me give you an instance. For those of you who wish you exercised more last year, what did you do instead of exercising? Yeah, you have no idea. I'm, I'm <laughs> no idea. But for those of you who did exercise, it made a complete, incredible difference in your life. See, it's so easy to just do the little things, the random things that don't mean anything. When consistently investing small amounts of time in an activity has immense benefits. So Paul says, make the most of our time. So, so my question to you is, in relationships and in finances and, in, and, and with your, your relationship with God, where do you want to be? Where is the destination? Where is Valley Fair for you? Where, where is that destination you're heading to? Because it could be way off. And it might take a long time to get there. But what is it for you? What does that look like? And are you on the road to get there? Are you on the road to get there? Because this is what the Lord's will is. Be careful then how you live. Be careful how you live. Be intentional. Because if you don't think about it, if you don't have a plan, if you don't put, put things, put intention to it, you will live as unwise, not as wise people. Make the most of every opportunity. Because so much is pulling you away from that. We are created as God's people for a purpose. Our purpose is to be his hands and feet in the world. His tangible presence to help the world know that there is a God who loves them and who has gone to the cross for them. There is a God who has done everything necessary to reunite with them. And that was the whole purpose of Christmas and Jesus dying on the cross. And if, if we keep wasting our time and just spending time on, on good things or f not good things or whatever, and we're not careful, we miss out on some of the greatest opportunities that God has for us. 
Paul stresses, live wisely and make the most of every opportunity. Why? Because in the areas that matter most, you can't make up for misspent time. You can't make up for misspent time in the areas that matter most. Now, I, I remember being a youth pastor, and I, I said something like this to teenagers one time, and they started mentioning all these things. No, you can't up, you can make, make up time. Like, for instance, um, let's say you don't show up for class. You're in college, you don't show up for class, and then you cram the night before. You do the all-nighter, and you get a C. Congratulations. See, I made up for the time, because we all know that C's get degrees, right? I mean, this is our motivation when you're in college. It just... God, I want to get a C. God, I want to get a C. And what's really amazing is you, when you cram for the test, it really promotes your spiritual life too because you get in there and you're like, God, I know I didn't go to class at all and I know I didn't study enough, but, but you, God, you are a God of grace and you are a God of mercy and oh God, you are a God of miracles. And so Lord, I just want a C. Can you please give me a C? Please tell me I'm not the only one who has prayed a ridiculous <laughs> prayer like that. I have. I mean, you know, and for business people, maybe there's been a presentation and you know you're not ready for it, so you cram the day before and you do okay. And then some of us even walk away saying, you know, I think I work better under pressure. You know, like, like you're giving yourself permission to procrastinate because, you know, I just, I'm awesome under pressure. And uh, yeah, okay, you can cram for some things. But in the most important things, the things that really matter, you can't make up for lost time. You can't cram and fix years of neglect in a marriage. You can't. When when your kids feel they don't know you, a quick shopping spree isn't going to fix it, you know? And it, it doesn't work with finances because getting in debt seems so easy. And we can do it so fast. But getting out, you can't cram for that. I know, well, if I won the lottery, yeah, um, I know, I know, exactly. And look at how that goes. Um, And think about spiritual maturity. Because you can't cram for intimacy with God. I mean, God is all there. He wants that. But like a marriage, like a relationship with your kids, like a relationship with a best friend, a relationship with God takes time. And you can't cram for it. You can't. In the most, in the most important areas of life, relationships, finances, and spiritual maturity, the first and last of which Paul spends all of the time in chapter 5 and 6 on, in the most important areas of your life, you can't cram. It takes small, consistent deposits of time. We don't get do-over, do-overs in these areas. That's why the Apostle Paul talked about doing the wise thing. What is the wise thing to do. Now, we all come from different backgrounds. I know that. Some of us have a great legacy uh, of parents who have loved us or they've really shown us a great example uh, of, to pass on to our kids. But I also know that others in here, we've experienced terrible abuses. There are people in here who have experienced deep tragedies that were unexpected. Maybe you've struggled with alcoholism or addiction. And you honestly have no idea what the wise thing to do is. You just don't know. Many of us, we just keep making choices that, that don't lead us to where we want to go. I mean, we know the destination. We know what we want healthy, whatever that looks like. But no matter how hard we try, we just can't seem to make the right choices to get there. Many of us are there in, in that situation. That's why God gives us each other. See, that's why God gives us community and relationships I need you to help me, to help show me pictures of where, of how to get to the destination and what it even looks like. And you need me to do the same. We, we need each other. That's why church is a family. It's a community. We need each other. But sometimes, sometimes there's just too much damage done. Sometimes we really, the, the hurt is too deep. The patterns are too ingrained. The, the unhealthy patterns are too ingrained in our life. And in that time, I, I really want to encourage you. Maybe, maybe for you to know what the wise decisions are, maybe it's time to get help. Maybe it's time to seek a professional. And I say that because I remember when, and I, sh- I shared this with you a long time ago about my wife passing away when I was in my 20s. I, I started going to a counselor for about a year. 
And that counselor helped shape the way I was thinking, the way I interpreted this event of my wife dying. I honestly can say, I don't think I would be here today had I not gone to counseling. I don't know what you've gone through, but I know that in a, a group this size, there are n- a number of people who the tragedy is too big, the, the bad experiences are too much. You need to get help, and it's okay. It's more than okay. It's the wise thing to do. And I want to encourage you, if, maybe if, if you have deep wounds, or maybe if you feel like you're out of control, or you keep hurting people in your life, please, I know this is kind of like a sidebar, but please, in 2018, get help. And if you keep, if you keep falling into those same behaviors, just know you're always going to get what you've always got. <laughs> if you keep doing the same thing over and over, you're going to get the same thing over and over. So make wise choices. Don't keep repeating the past mistakes. So, to put this, this passage into perspective, to, to learn how to be careful and to live wisely, to learn how to make the most of every opportunity, I think the best way to do that is just to ask yourself some questions. And that's kind of where we're going to apply it today, to ask yourself some questions about those key areas in life. On a scale of 1 to 10, how is your relationship with those around you? Maybe extended family, brothers and sisters. Maybe it's your spouse. But on a scale of 1 to 10, don't tell me. This is just between you and God. How are you doing in your relationships? Are, are you healthy? Is your relationship with your spouse, 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 spouse healthy? Or is it growing distant? Does your spouse feel loved? Does your spouse feel valuable? Or do, they, do they feel like they have to struggle to measure up to what your expectations are? Or do they feel loved unconditionally? What, what needs to change in your closest relationships? What's the wise thing to do? What, what do you want your marriage to be like? What do you want the relationships that struggle, what do you want them to be like? Do you, in your marriage, do you want to enjoy each other? Do you want to laugh together again? Do you want there to be the spirit of acceptance and grace rather than criticism? What small behaviors will put you on a trajectory towards health? Because it, it is the small, consistent behaviors that lead to immense change. I mean, as I asked myself this question this week, it became very apparent that Raylan and I hadn't gone out on a date in a while. We've been busy and we've been running. And I'm, I, I remembered when I was studying for this that I haven't been romancing Raylan like when we were dating. And I realized immediately, I'm like, yep, I'm a heel. Yep, I'm, you know, I, I need to do this. So as I share with you, please know God is speaking to me too. I, I realize I don't do the wise thing. I need to hit the reset button. Many of us been so, have been so busy with life that we're not heading in the same direction with our spouse. We don't have the same goals. And in fact, and this is what scares me the most, I might not even know what Ray Lynn's goals are anymore. Maybe it's time to have a conversation and ask about her goals Maybe, maybe it's time to pursue a hobby together. <laughs> I thought, yeah, maybe it's time to go for a walk. And I was like, no, I'm not going for a walk. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we'll just get, yeah, I know, we'll just get a babysitter and go out on a date and, you know, or send them out because it's cold. And, um, but in light of where you want to be, what is the wise thing to do in your relationships? What about your kids? Do your kids actually know you like them? I mean, at least more than you like Facebook. It sounds crazy, but I read a statistic last year that um, kid, one of the biggest complaints that children have, like high school and middle school children have, is that their parents are on the phone too much. And I was like, did I get that wrong? Is it the parents complaining about the kids? No. They did a survey of like, you know, a bazillion children, and what the, one of the top complaints was my mom or dad is on the phone too much. <sighs> Do your kids feel like you pursue them? Do they trust that you have their best interest in mind? Do your kids feel like they struggle to measure up to your expectations? See, what small, consistent things do you need to change 
to improve your relationship with your kids. I am haunted by the question, how will my girls remember me? How will they remember me? Do I want to be remembered as a dad who loved them more than my job or more than my ministry, my favorite hobby? I do. And I find that too often I say no to them to do the random things that don't really matter rather than the wise, small investments of time that, consist, that are consistent and that can change our lives. You know, I mean, it might be playing catch or bumping a volleyball with Allie or playing, it sounds funny, playing PlayStation with Riley or Barbie. <laughs> <laughs> Woo, that, that one's a tough one. But my girls are 9 and 15, and I have three years left with Allie. What do I need to do right now that I won't be able to do in a few years? What do I need to do to invest the time? I know the answer because it's practice driving. And that is a sacrifice because I lose years of my life every time I get in the car. Allie, if you're listening to this on tape, do n- hit pause now. Okay. <laughs> but seriously, it's, it's, what do I need to do? What about our finances? Are you in debt? So Most of us are. Are you consistently spending more than you make? What needs to change so that you can begin crawling out of debt? What what consistent things can you do starting in January 1st of 2018 to get to that point? I mean, maybe maybe it is getting another job or downgrading the phone or the car or cable TV. Maybe it's cutting up the credit card. I don't know, and I don't want to be the Holy Spirit for you. But what is the wise thing to do? And then finally, and probably most importantly, the relationship with God. How is it? How are you doing? One to ten. How are you doing with God? How intimate is the relationship? How connected do you feel? Or how distant do you feel? Are you pursuing Him? Because I promise you this, it might not feel like it, but He's pursuing you deeply. Are you investing consistent time with Him? Is there some behavior or attitude that hinders your behavior with them? I mean, what, 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 would a, what would the destination look like with God? What would you like a relationship with God to look like? Are you doing anything to get there? What, what, how, how awesome would it be to deal with some of the doubts that you have about God? Or, or to experience intimacy with Him? Maybe, maybe even learning how to pray. What small, consistent activities and behaviors can you do to move in that direction? Well, let me give you an easy one. Go to bed on time. Wake up 15 minutes early. You know, so many of us, we stay up so late that honestly getting up in the morning is crazy. Or we just run so hard and that we jump in bed and we just fall asleep. Well, I don't care whether you get, you, you spend time with God for 15 minutes in the evening or the morning, I would encourage you, 15 minutes, foster that relationship. You know, we've talked about the U version plans. If you don't know, read Ephesians 5 and 6. That's a great place to start. Maybe it's reading a chapter a day in a Christian classic. You know, a really good book to help you become more mature. If you don't know where to start, email me. I'm, I'm friends with half of you on Facebook. Facebook message me, whatever. E- what, Write a note on your connection card. It will get to me. But there are some great books that you can begin reading. 15 minutes a day, five minutes a day. And maybe, and this is where I'm closing, maybe it's the best thing you could do is commit to being a part of a church family. This is an amazing family. I love this family. I even said, I was talking to Ray before we started, and uh, he was asking me some questions, and I said, well, um, as a lakesider, I, and I was like, I call myself a lakesider. That's awesome. <laughs> this is like, you're my family. I love this place. If you, if you have not committed to being a part of a church family, commit to this one or commit to one because this is an amazing place. Because consistently investing small amounts of time has a cumulative benefit. So where do you need to begin? You can't cram for the things that are most important. But you know what? Tomorrow's a new day. January 1st, 2018. It's a new day. How about starting fresh? Because you can pay now or you can pay later, but you're always going to pay. But if you pay now, it's so much cheaper than if you pay later. 
So what is the wise thing to do? This is God's will. Be very careful then how you live. Don't live as unwise but as wise people, making the most of every single opportunity because the days are evil. They will always pull you away from what is good. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Let's pray together. God, I want to thank you that um, this is, I know this message is very different than what I've, I normally do. And, but for me, it was incredibly practical this week as I thought about my life and how I live, how I use my time. I pray, God, that uh, it's also beneficial for others in here. Lord, help us to use our wise timely as individuals, as, as parts of a family, and as part of this church family. Help us to use our time wisely because it is so limited. And you have given us a purpose. Our purpose is to love you and love people, to, to be the t- your hands and feet to love the world around us. And God, when we get caught up in our own stuff, it's so easy to forget that. So help us, Lord. Help us change our priorities. Help us to keep our eyes focused on you. Help us to be true followers of Jesus in every area of our life. And God, I pray that you, you will transform our hearts and you will help us be the kind of people you have created us to be. It's in your name we pray.